Um, so again, you know, the stagecoach effectively disappears, okay, and Belfast, as you see there, links with Balmina and Armagh, Dublin and Cork line is complete by 1850. And it's, you know, that's the same line today. It hasn't changed or altered, it's the same route. So it's there from 1850. Um, and again, so the total mileage, so there was 550, and all of the spur lines that come off the Dublin um, and Cork route are Mallow and Tralee, Limerick and Waterford lines, Mulgar and Galway, and then you have the, uh, the development of um, Oma and Coleraine routes to Derry. And that's, if you like, where we depart from the kind of national thing <coughs> to more local. Um, and this is a, the um, opening uh, page of the London Derry and Coleraine um, Railway Company, um, their first meeting. And you can get a sense of the scale of it um, in that you have, if you like, the capital up there, the, um, sorry because I know people at the back, but they're looking for 500,000 sterling to set up the railway. And you know, if you, if you think of that, that's probably close to like 500 million today in terms of, so it's, you know, it's a vast, um, endeavour um, from their perspective and they have their provisional committee um, and there's one name at the top which is John Lewis Ricardo you see you can probably make out the MPs okay so there's a heavyweight group of liberal um, MPs and you have a list of local names and one of the values of that if you're looking at local history is you can start to piece together you know the main individuals the main businessmen in Northern Ireland Okay, these are the guys, these are the go-to guys. Okay, these are the guys with cash. These are the guys who can make things happen. So part of doing kind of local history, part of doing this kind of history and using something like railways is it allows you to reconstruct a social network. And in this case, the business network. Who knew who? Okay, who do they call on for cash? And then these are the more probably again the more progressive guys in the area, the guys who are prepared to go with something new like railroads. Um, and the engineer there that they the engineer they picked out is a guy called um, uh, Robert Stevenson, who's the son of George, the, the, the original uh, railway, the, the original guy who made the rocket. Okay, you know. So again, they're going over to the UK and getting the best expertise to assist them in this. And um, so, I mean, one of the things that I said at the start. I'm kind of new to the whole thing of, of railways because it's a different route, if you like, for me. So I was kind of fascinated by this document. And one of the things as well is that I suppose I'm here, I'm talking on behalf of the OU, and I use the same resources that are available to the students that I teach in the master's program to go and track down some of this stuff. And um, this is actually um, from the Glasgow Herald. Okay, so I can go on and I can search um, our websites because we have all of the 19th century papers online and there was 700 hits on newspapers for the London Derry and Coleraine Railway and I chose the first one because obviously it was the easiest but it was also the Glasgow Herald and it's looking for investors in Glasgow and it's explaining the project to the readers of the Glasgow Herald and it gives you the names again and this time in a little bit more legible uh, format okay because it's printed and you can see there's obviously a huge group from um, Derry, okay, um, the mayor is involved, and then you get the list of secretaries, it tells you who their solicitors are, which is very interesting. If you, again, if you're tracking stuff down, and you're trying to piece together your local railway, maybe the solicitors have deposited their papers here in Crony, and you can get that material. And then you have the bankers, and again, it may be the same thing, maybe their banking records here, that give you more detail, okay? In other words, how wealthy were all of those guys? You know, um, can we create an order of wealth or magnitude to them? Like, because you Irish bankers, okay, because the British bankers are there as well. Um, and what was interesting in this prospectus and what was interesting about the Glasgow Herald was that they actually provided a little bit more um, explanation. And um, I know that that one will be slightly difficult to, to look at, but essentially what they're explaining in that is that. Um, that they're, um, they're giving an explanation of why they've been a little bit delayed in their project, and they want to link up with the people who are reclaiming um, areas of Loch Foyle. Um, so there's another group that they're connecting with. Um, and then, you know, it gives you an idea, well, why are they reclaiming 
or you know, why are they waiting for that? And then they want to build a particular embankment and they need that to happen. And um, uh, so, you know, and then they give you the costs of all of the things just in this paragraph. So, you know, it'd be around 300,000. Um, and the projected line is free from all engineering difficulty, it says. Um, there'll be one tunnel, there'll be 30 miles of the main line, and there'll be a branch line of seven miles. So, you know, you start to get a little bit more detail, and this is in one of the newspapers. And again, it's the Glasgow Herald, but it has plenty of information on this, you know, what we would regard as a relatively local event. Um, and so it provides you a little bit more, and also it provides you with some more names to track down. And part of all of local history, or even, you know, whatever academic history, and I'm not sure there's ever really a distinction, but it's all detective work. It's about chasing down names, chasing down information, to put back and reconstruct what happened. Okay, it's just exactly like any kind of detective. You're trying to figure out what happened. So you've got to follow all the leads. And one of the things that interested me was, again, who was this guy? Ricardo, okay, um, you know, because normally in Ireland the O goes at the front of the name, obviously, so, um, um, so the, this, two, this guy, John Lewis Ricardo, um, again, the resources that are available to the students that we have, this is the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, um, and this is his biography that is up in that, and essentially he is described as a politician and entrepreneur, um, he was the nephew of David Ricardo. Okay, so some of you may have come across him as one of the, like Adam Smith, one of the early kind of um, political kind of theories of communists. Um, it says he was, you know, great athletic prowess when he was young. Um, basically, he and how did they define his great athletic prowess? Basically, he rode a horse bareback up a staircase and into a dining room in some house in London. So you know, um, someone who had a little bit of a wild um, youth. Um, I doesn't say whether he was sober or not at the time, um, and um, so. But he he was going to the army, and obviously you can see his youthful career would have definitely predisposed him to that kind of activity. But he essentially goes into banking business, which is what his family does. becomes an MP. But most importantly, why is he involved in Northern Ireland in London, the London area Coleraine railways? Because when you look at it, so he was chairman of the North Staffordshire Railway Company from its inception. Okay, until his death, he was chairman of the Norwegian Trunk Railway, um, whose uh, who construction he jointly supervised um, with the chairman of the Metropolitan Railway Company. He was a director of London Westminster Bank, okay. Um, it also seems to tell you that he was um, an accomplished amateur artist. But the point is, they're getting in someone who has deep connections into London finance, but more than that, this is a guy who has already started up a railway company. Okay, so the, the locals are know what they're doing, they're getting in, you know, kind of one of the best guns, the hired guns in the UK to come in and help them do it. Okay, and, and that's one of the point that it's all interconnected. I mean, you know, Glasgow is investing in this, they're hiring guys in from London. It's almost impossible in Ireland to actually tweeze out these things and sort of say, well, this is a purely Irish project or a purely English project. It never really works out that way because everything is, is completely interconnected. Um, and um, again, one of the nice things about the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography it tells you that his archives, that he has letters in the University of Durham. So maybe he mentions London during a career, maybe not. You can always email the archivist. Um, and uh, well, he, one of the things there, I think, if I'm maybe right, is that this is the Athenium. As far as I know, is one of the posture gentlemen's clubs in London. Um, and so, obviously, they've been a member of that as well. But again, he's, he, if he was, and if you can verify that, again, he's someone with connections all over London. Okay? So, obviously, a very useful individual um, to be part of. And you can see that then in his chair, he's the chairman of the company, because when you move on to the next page or whatever, next meeting, he has been made chair of. Londonderry and Coleraine Company, and obviously there is a perception that this must be profitable. I mean, Ricardo is not going to come over from London unless he regards this as a very valuable company to be involved with. So, um, you know, it says a lot about the economic kind of strength of the region for him to come over. He's obviously not going to be interested in, in, the, in, in what he regards as the local railway in some other areas, but this is something that attracts him to come here. Um, and in this one, in the second section, 
Here, it gives you a breakdown of the investors, where they're from. So you have people from Manchester investing, people from London, and an Irish and Scottish list, you have Mr. Ricardo's personal list of investors, presumably people he brings with him to projects. Okay, so you can track all of this down. So this is only from, if you like, the first couple of meetings, and you can go away and you can check the newspapers, and you can check the Oxford Dictionary of National Health, and you can find out who all of these kind of guys are, and very quickly you begin to piece together, if you like, the emergence of, of the commercial operations of the company, and who's involved, and how much they're investing, and so on. So it's very quickly, you know, you, uh, you very quickly get to all of those things. Um, so what I wanted to show you as well some of the pearls of actually local research. And you may think that, you know, people always say, well, do you know Latin, do you know Greek, if you're going back to medieval history and all this kind of stuff. But the problem is not even Latin or Greek, it's English and handwriting. Okay? Um, and this is a letter from um, a file series, solicitor, solicitor's files, the Strange and Brett, um, with um, offices in Belfast. Um, but it's actually, as you see there, that in the only part that's probably really commercial buildings, Dundalk. Um, and they're writing to the solicitors here to essentially get a list of potential investors in a new railway venture. And this is in um, 1877, and it's a, rail, it's a railroad uh, way between um, Port of Ferry um, and Belfast or Newton Arts. They haven't decided on the line, but they want to build one of those two options. Uh, eventually goes to Port of Ferry. Uh, but he's, he's basically asking the solicitor, do you have a list of names of people I can write to? Um, and that took a good few hours to actually decipher, <laughs> because it's just one of those things with writing is that, you know, if you're going to do local history this period, it's actually one of the real things is to bring the magnifying glass and bring a lot of patience in terms of going through these things. But again, it gives you the sense of who's connected to who. Why would you write to them? Obviously, they're um, uh, you know someone who um, can provide him with a list of good commercial contacts, or else those solicitors are particularly maybe known to operate on behalf of people or trusts, okay, yeah. or whatever. But um, so it's again, it was the solicitors' files that I found that document. Then, so again, it's an allegation that sometimes um, what Crony said was that it was a there was railway material in it and. There was a lot of wills, and there was a lot of other material, and there was a lot of other things. And eventually, you dig down and you get the railway material, uh, and you have to have that kind of, kind of, I suppose, tenacity sometimes to go after and get things. But the nice thing is that if it is in a box like that, and there are wills and there are other things, then they're probably connected. Um, so you can actually go away and find out who, you know, when you have more time, if you have more time to go and dig out and really read the wills and find out um, who they're representing and therefore who the potential investors that he was looking for are, and. Again, I suppose the nice point is that um, yeah, this is Dundalk again, which is you know again just kind of sense of being interconnected and everything is you know there may be archives in Dundalk that this person has left material in, and again that will tread you or lead you um, to them. Um, 